Welcome back, everybody. We return for another episode of the Newcomer's Guide class series for Grim Dawn and are plowing forward with the Occultist class. My name is Winback, and I will be taking you on this journey again today. But the class that you see on the front of the box, the poster boy, if you will, for Grim Dawn, at least the base game, is the Occultist. The Occultist is our first big pet class, having two summons with their own ability trees and health bars. But before we dive in, just remember it is a YouTube video, so feel free to like, comment, subscribe your heart out. Let me know if you have any questions about the game, if there is content that you'd like to see, anything that you want to know. I will do my best to answer those or provide the type of video that you're looking for. Now, on our list of active abilities, we're actually going to kick things off with the smallest and most ocular ability in the Occultist's kit, and we're talking about Dreeg's Evil Eye. Evil Eye has no cooldown and is therefore spammable, but does relatively little amounts of damage because of that. The ability is going to do both acid and poison damage, and it's going to fire off in a straight line. So it seems kind of wimpy, right? Now let's talk about the four masteries down the tree that make it much less wimpy. Uh, Blood Burst is the first in line, and it will make our eyeballs explode when they hit people, much like real life. The radius will increase as you put points in it, and with the small amount of weapon damage and flat acid and poison damage on top of that, you can start buffing the, uh, the ability up quite a bit. So Focused Gaze is actually my personal favorite modifier in this tree, and it only requires one point. It's going to give Evil Eye a cooldown, but in exchange for that, we're going to get an even bigger area of effect. We're going to get crit damage increased, and then we're going to buff both acid and poison damage. Uh, add on to that that we are going to be reducing enemy physical damage and modify the total damage of the ability by 135%, and you can see why that short little 4 second cooldown is totally worth it. On 4 seconds, you essentially get Eyeball Grenade, and I don't think that I need to explain it any further than that. Terrifying Gaze is the next mastery for your opto I mean, uh, cultist. Uh, this one is mostly a damage increaser, but we also get a small chance for some pretty neat utility. Terrifying Gaze is going to add a flat vitality damage to begin with, buff your acid and poison damage, and add a honking amount of crit damage to the ability. And then the final small thing you'll be able to get is a chance to either stun or confuse targets hit by the eye. Now, if you're the type of player who keeps the spammable nature of the eye, the small chance will be plenty simply based on the number of eyes that you can throw. Vile Eruption is your final eye exam ability and is going to further increase your explosion radius while also launching chunks of viscera at enemies. The more points you put in, the more chunks you get. The chunks are going to be dealing acid and vitality damage, so they'll feed off of earlier masteries pretty well. Uh, this entire skill branch will ultimately keep you safe in fights while your pets are up front and tanking for you because it is a ranged ability and if you're going for a squishy pet build that will certainly help. If you need something to compare it to you can always look back at the uh, brimstone talent for the demolitionists autos where they splinter off those uh, flesh chunks operate similarly similarly for sure. Uh, now our next ability is much shorter on the length of the mastery but almost pure utility. Curse of Frailty is an area of effect slow, physical damage reduction, and bleed resistance shredding ability with a short duration and no cooldown. If you pick up vulnerability on the next tier, you'll also get the ability to remove defensive ability and shred the resistance of acid poison, vitality, and elemental damage types. So even though this ability gets absolutely zero damage, it's gonna make all of your damage abilities in those types hit extra hard. Not only that, but slowing and the defensive ability removal can make it much easier to kite if you're going for that ranged occultist type. Bloody Pox is the third active ability in the occultist kit, and despite painting a mental picture of bleeding from every orifice, it's actually going to do... Well, it's actually going to do exactly that. Uh, the bad guys are going to bleed from everywhere. Pox is going to deal vitality and bleeding damage, which makes sense, but more importantly, it's actually going to do percent health damage up to 13% per cast. This is actually nutters for butters, 
And then Fevered Rage is the first mastery that we've seen so far that is actually going to buff enemies while also dealing some even harder damage to them. So this one is going to let Pox deal more percent health damage, but it's going to give the enemies a huge burst of speed, increase their offensive ability as well. The good news is that it will also remove defensive ability and modify the total damage by 40%, so that should hopefully have the monsters dead before they can eat your nuts in a frenzy of blood-fueled haze, but, you know, once you get further on in the game, maybe that percentage health damage isn't worth it, so... Keep an eye on the ability the further you go. Make your own decisions. You know what we do here. Now, Wasting is the next mastery for Bloody Pox, adding flat vitality damage and buffing bleeding damage while massively reducing offensive ability. It's not the flashiest, but still really helpful. Uh, Black Death will round out the tree with an increased duration, more flat poison damage, vitality, and bleeding damage buffs with the diseased cherry on top being a chance to confuse infected enemies. And if you weren't aware, I uh, don't think it required mentioning, but confused enemies will attack other enemies. So there you go. Our next active and one I find particularly helpful in tank uh, cultist builds is called Sigil of Consumption. Are you sensing the theme? Everything is the devil. This is the devil class. Okay, well, maybe not the actual devil, but the occultist reaches into some dark deities in the realm of Cairn for its mega edgy aesthetic, and Sigil of Consumption is just going to drop a big screaming red circle on the ground that gets larger the more points that you put into it. Add to that the flat vitality, vitality, decay, and damage converted to health, and what you're looking at is a giant vampire circle. Destruction is the only mastery for civil, er, for Sigil, sorry, and is going to buff the vitality damage we were already doing while putting some flat chaos and fire damage on it as well. Active ability number five is going to be the Blood of Dreg, and while it sounds pretty aggressive, it's mostly a defensive ability. So Blood of Dreg is actually going to activate in a radius, meaning it will apply to outward uh, pets and allies. Once the button is pressed, you'll get a percentage health back, percentage heal, uh, health regen, offensive ability, and acid retaliation. It also, oddly enough, adds a small amount of acid damage to your weapon attacks, uh, which is cool for you if you're building acid, your pets if they do acid, or buddies if they have an acid-based build. Pretty interesting. Aspect to the Guardian is the next mastery for Blood of Dreg and is actually going to buff your vitality, acid, and poison damage. It's even going to go a step further and buff all of your retaliation damage significantly as well. So defensively speaking, this will give you a physical resistance to help stop trauma damage, but will uh, buff acid and poison resistances as well. So considering everything that this ability can do, it is hugely impactful as a panic button once it's sufficiently leveled. So I would definitely, definitely, definitely recommend this ability no matter what type of class you are building if you are taking the occultist. Really, really strong stuff here. Now, uh, with the final active ability coming up for us, uh, probably my favorite in the entire game, uh, we get to, to end the active tree on Doombolt. And it sounds exactly as cool as it is. The most cranky red lightning bolt that will change huge angry monsters into literal blood mist. Doombolt has no masteries or upgrades, but when your whole purpose is to nuke people from orbit with chaos and vitality damage, Doom Bolt is on an entirely separate level. Add to that, the Bolt is going to increase its crit damage as well, and then the nuked from orbit metaphor seems a little underwhelming by comparison. Now let's get into the next set of abilities, which is our summons. We have summons, we're not doing passives yet. Uh, Summon Familiar is the first ability we've got, which is Little Blackbird. As our bird buddy scales, it's going to get crit damage, energy regen, energy regen, wow. All damage and health. Uh, when I say all damage, that means it's just going to buff all the damage types that the, the bird does. It's even got its own little ability that does lightning and electrocute damage. I believe it's called lightning orb. And then mend flesh is your first familiar mastery. And it does exactly that. This gives the familiar the ability to heal in an AoE. And that heal can go up to 15% of max health based on level. Uh, Storm Spirit is going to be your next mastery down the line. Is going to provide a bunch of passive bonuses. We're going to get flat elemental damage, buffed elemental damage, elemental resistance, 
and Lightning Retaliation. And then the last mastery on the familiar tree is going to be Lightning Strike. Lightning Strike is another active ability for our bird boy on top of his heel and his Lightning Orb. So Lightning Strike is going to deal pet damage, Lightning and Electrocute damage, some nuts crit damage, and for all that juicy damage, the bird is also going to stun the bad guys. Lightning Strike's only moderate downside is that it's an 8 second cooldown, which isn't the greatest, but for everything that it does, I'd call it a fair trade. Now the next summon on the table is everything that the occultist should be and is aptly named Summon Hellhound. Our Heat Hound is going to be dealing physical and fire damage with normal attacks and has a baseline ability that deals fire, physical, and chaos damage. Not only that, but this ability also has a percent health reduction. Even the vanilla pup without masteries can be an absolute monster. Speaking of masteries, our first mastery is called Ember Claw and is an active ability that gives the Toasty Terrier a whole bunch of really cool stats. Ember, uh, sorry, Ember Claw is an AOE cleave ability that will deal fire and chaos damage in a huge arc. Uh, that arc gets bigger with levels. So eventually it kind of becomes this, I think it's 240 degrees in front of the, the Hellhound, uh, which will actually almost reach behind the Hellhound too. So it's just a big ass AOE cleaver that's going to hit a lot of people and do a lot of good stuff for you. <sighs> now Hellfire is the next one up. That's going to give you a flat fire and chaos damage, uh, but it is also going to buff your burn damage. It also increases the defensive ability and gives you some fire retaliation. And it is a pretty slick little aura that follows around the Hellhound. So you don't even have to turn it on as long as the Hellhound is summoned. The aura will be casting off of your pet in conjunction with any auras that you've got on yourself. And then the last ability in the mastery tree for the Hellhound is Infernal Breath. It's another ability that our Roasting Rottweiler can cast with a pretty long range and it also deals fire, chaos, and burn damage. So it's right at home with the rest of our demonic influence in that it will toast people from a distance, all from the mouth of our happy little pup. That is it for our summons though, there's only two, so now we can move on to our full passive abilities. And since we just came off of our summons, we'll just move over to Bonds of Bismil to start us off. Bonds is one uh, mas is a one mastery passive that is going to give some very simple stats in the form of percent health increases and energy regen. Once you've hit max rank with this ability, it will literally double the health of your pets. If we then put on our next bunch of points into uh, manipulation, which is the only mastery for bonds, we can get all of our pets a bonus to all of their damage and a pretty huge chunk of total speed increase. And total speed is going to be uh, movement speed, attack speed, and cast speed. So pretty simple, but still really, really, really strong stats if you're trying to arrange yourself a pet army. I would 100% get this ability. Next on the list is an auto attack modifier called Soleil's Witchfire. The baseline passive is gonna provide flat chaos damage uh, buffs to both Vitality and Vitality Decay, while capping it off with a relatively strong attack speed increase. I think it's 15% at maximum value. So if you take the first Mastery for Witchfire, you'll start converting physical damage into Chaos, while imparting the same conversion to your pets with some flat Chaos damage of their own. So we can start converting lots of physical weapons, especially early on in the game, uh, into chaos and giving our pets some pretty righteous chaos conversions as well. Uh, second right is your last mastery, but also the third. So even though the name doesn't even match our intentions, it's still pretty strong, actually. I guess if we're not counting Soleil's Witchfire as a mastery, it would be the second. <laughs> That's pretty high. Hmm. Anyway, so, uh, second right is one of those masteries that will give you both offensive and defensive stats. You'll get some flat vitality and vitality decay stats, uh, buff to chaos damage, and most importantly for those later levels, you'll actually get up to 25% vitality resistance. When it comes to the higher difficulties, resistance talents can never be understated, and there are a couple in the occultist kit that will really help you 
make your way through things. Now we've made it all the way to the end of the ability tree with Possession, aptly named and ready to sneak directly into your soul. Possession is an exclusive skill, uh, but is completely worth it. So five damage types with one ability, and you're getting flat chaos damage, but you're gonna get buffed Acid, Poison, Vitality, Vitality Decay, and Chaos Damage with this ability. Now add to that that we get Damage Absorption, Chaos Resistance, and Skill Disruption Protection, and you can see an ability that not only makes us do more damage, it's also gonna make us insanely tanky. Now, Skill Disruption Protection is protection against abilities that are going to silence you, uh, like we mentioned in previous videos. Uh, but that is ultimately, I think that's later down the line of priority in the defensive stats that Possession gives you. Really, the Chaos Resistance, for me, is right up top there, and the Damage Absorption, also very, very strong. This is an ability that I use on my Witchblade class, which is pure tank, uh, for the most part, for me, with a focus on Sigil of Consumption, but it is is insanely helpful for keeping me alive with that build and I really really love it for what it does. Now that is going to do it for the occultist skill tree everybody. It may not be a lot to look at at least from a glance but as you start diving into the abilities you can really start to recognize all the potential that the class has. Uh, I'd highly highly recommend the occultist class if you're looking at playing a healthy or even a melee focused build. Uh, but this bad boy will make any pet build shine as well. So if you wanted to couple it with something like a necromancer or a shaman, you could potentially get some very, very big beefy boys following you around all game long. Now, since we're already out of stuff to talk about for the occultist skill tree, and we've got plenty of gameplay left, I'll kind of catch you guys up to where we are currently in the story. We've killed the Logorian. The base game for Grim Dawn is over. So we can't... Well, not necessarily can't. There are plenty of side missions happening on in the background, but as it stands right now, I'm pretty underleveled for where I want to be. I'm only level 44. I'd really like to be at least level 50 or higher with being in uh, the Ugdenbog here, but... That just wasn't in the cards. I didn't actually do enough uh, off-camera grinding to get me up there, so the item that we picked up from Creed after killing the Loghorian isn't actually usable even if we wanted to use it for another six levels. So, basically, Inquisitor Creed has sent us off into Ugdenbog, which is the swampy, foresty area on the northern side of, well, northeastern side of the map, full of witches, full of cannibals, full of all sorts of dark stuff that just requires all the hero's attention all at once. Uh, if I am being honest, I thought that this this little trip here felt a little bit forced uh, to Barrel Home, but the more that I play the game, the more that I find that the, uh, the Barrel Home quests have some more fun stuff to do. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are playing through here. The Barrel Home quest, the Barrel Home uh, Quartermaster, the faction, the shop, uh, they all have some pretty cool stuff in there. So the big celestial boss as well, the Ravager, uh, is all uh, located in this area, I suppose. It's all tied to Barrel Home and your faction identity with them. So if you find yourself needing that type of farm and you want to take on that type of boss, definitely start putting your focus into Barrel Home. Since we've just made it there, though, really all we have to do is complete a few cursory uh, or introductory quests, I'd suppose, for the, the denizens of Barrel Home, uh, even though it always feels icky when completing quests for these people, because these people are, in fact, icky in every sense of the word. That may not even do it justice, but you get what I'm talking about. Play the game, you'll understand more and more as you go. Now we have to get the Ugdenbog fetish from the Barrel Home leader, bring it to the coven. You can opt to just murder everyone in Barrel Home, and 
To be perfectly honest with you, I've done it before. It feels much better than doing the quests, but quests give XP, and really, it's a little bit tough to give that kind of stuff up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, killing them is an option. I would highly recommend it if you're the type of person who would uh, rather take the moral high ground. You know? <laughs> Murder and moral high ground. You're welcome. Learning things on this channel every day. So, uh, ultimately, the the quest that we've done in Barrel Home so far uh, were pretty simple to accomplish. A lot of them are just rescue this person, kill these monsters, clear out this dungeon, uh, and then we have to find Laria the Hexer. We have to find the witch who is annoying the people of Barrel Home, and we have to uh, deal with her. Uh, unfortunately, I am currently walking in the wrong direction, and because I didn't light up the entire map of Ugdenbog, I can't recall where Laria is located on the map, because her den has a very unique look to it, and you can pick it out as soon as you see it on the map, uh, but I'm actually going the wrong direction. So what you'll want to do is take the Ugdenbog Rift, and you'll want to go north from the Ugdenbog Rift. You'll find eventually a set of um, wooden stairs that'll take you up to her hut. And then basically you just hop inside there, talk to her, see what she's all about. I thought this was it. Turns out this is just another quest that we're going to have to complete for the witches of Ugdenbog. So we're just going to knock it out right now with Janaxia's den. Janaxia the Betrayer. Uh, you will eventually get this quest from the the Coven Matriarch, I think it is. After you've completed all the Barrow Home stuff and you go back and talk and you save Old Grimm and... Spoilers, sorry. Uh, but you have to kill her. So there she is. We've located her. She's a little bit, uh... A little bit rough. Uh, I believe she is like a cannibal witch. So that's, that's how, um... She looks to be portrayed anyway. But, uh... Yeah, certainly giving us a run for our money, especially with us being six levels off of the target that I wanted to be at right now. So she's, she's doing some damage. Uh, luckily, we've got the Hellfire Mines going the entire fight while trying to stand in if our Blackwater Cocktail actually went where I was clicking, we'd be standing in that as well. But she's dead. Thank God. It took a really long time. And we can actually go try to find uh, Laria, the, the one that we're supposed to be looking for. So we're going to click on the Utenbog Rift and go north. Because it is at this exact moment that it clicked in my brain, oh yeah, I'm going the wrong direction. Ugh. It is a little bit unfortunate that we couldn't put any uh, occultist gameplay footage in our playthrough, because I really do like that class. But hopefully the, uh, the little edited blurbs are enough for you guys to at least see the abilities and how all that stuff works out. I do want to make it through the playthrough of the entire game while still having stuff to talk about, so. They wanted me to murder you, but I can't, because I know you're not a bad lady. So, see you later, I guess. But yeah, that is going to do it. We'll go talk to Skorv over in the Barrow Home uh, township center, get the quest completed, and then, uh, I mean, go about our, our merry way with the Ugdenbog fetish. So, not a whole lot left to talk about in this episode, but, again, it's a YouTube video. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe your heart out. Crack open this chest after we can walk around our couch and return to the main storyline. That's gonna do it for me, though, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. And then if you are still watching right now, Skorv is located behind the houses at this crude little altar with three of his people. And we're just going to lie to him about the murder of the witch. So, that's about it. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>